Okay. <laughs> Waiting on him. <laughs> oh. Welcome to Search Talk Live with search engine optimization and marketing experts Robert O'Haver and Matt Weber. Powered by the Robert Palmer family of companies. All right, welcome back to another episode of Search Talk Live. Sorry we're running a little late. We had some technical difficulties. I'm uh, With me today is Matt Weber. Matt, how's it going? Hey, doing fantastic. And I got to tell you, I am I know we almost say this every show, <laughs> but I'm, I'm really, really, really pumped for today's show. I am too. Yeah, we have an awesome guest. Uh, today, guys, if you, are, if you have questions for our guest, you can go on Twitter and type hashtag Search Talk Live if you have a question for our guest. But today, I don't want to hold us up any longer, but our, today our guest is one of our top guests. Uh, he, he's uh, got one of the li- most listened to episodes of the, sh- of the show. Uh, today our guest is Yoast DeVolk of Yoast, uh, CEO and uh, founder of Yoast. See, how's, it, how's it going, Yoast? Well, it's pretty good. I'm actually no longer the CEO of Yoast. Oh, you're not? No. Wow. No, I've been, uh, I've been uh, replaced Okay. Uh, but in a good way. Uh, no, I'm now Chief Product Officer, Yoast, and uh, Marika, my wife and also uh, a longtime partner, is now our CEO. Nice. Because she's much, much, much better at actually keeping the company in check. There you go. Um, so, yeah. So those of the, those of the people that live under a rock and don't know who you are, if you could uh... – Tell us a little bit about yourself and and where you're at now. Um, so I uh, am a WordPress uh, developer, SEO. Uh, well, I've been I've been doing a lot of things. I've been in the SEO industry for 14 years now, um, uh, doing all sorts of things. And somewhere about 10 years ago, I started building WordPress plugins. And one of those was, uh, uh, well, a couple of those later on evolved into something that's now known as Yoast SEO, um, which is the most popular piece of SEO software on the planet. Yeah, no, this blows my mind every time you tell me, but approximately how many users do you have? Uh, currently, Yoast SEO is running on about 9 million websites. Uh, uh, so um, we're running on about uh, 14% of the top 1 million sites in the world. Um, have a uh, well, and, and a couple more uh, in the in the lower parts. So no, yeah, it's 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 a ridiculous amount. I mean, you, you you should not think about it too much because if you think about it too much, it becomes very hard to release new versions. <laughs> it's a fantastic tool, Robert. I know you're a big advocate. You use it. We use it at Roar, and I think it was really the first tool that kind of simplified. Uh, SEO and made it more accessible to the mass users. Wouldn't you agree, Robert? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, it, it's it's called a plugin, and it's definitely you don't have. It's not like you just can set it and forget it, but uh, it sure makes life much easier. And I know you guys have been working hard because I've been getting updates like probably every two weeks or every week. It seems yeah, like- there's a rid- ridiculous amount of people on it uh, right now. Uh, we're actually working on one of our most big, uh, one of our biggest updates uh, for quite a while. Um, uh, redoing all our schema output uh, and, make it, and making that um, about 20 times better than it's ever been. Yo, so we've got a lot of uh, really deep SEO and WordPress questions coming at you. But before we get into it, I got to be selfish for just a minute. You have a March 19th video that you released, and you are wearing some crazy cool shoes. No, that's, Where did they come from? That's, that's all the time. <laughs> I, uh, These are mega crazy. I have uh, like 20 pairs of those, uh, <laughs> literally. Uh, it's uh, They all come from one store in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, called Mascolori, M-A-S-C-O-L-O-R-I, dot N-L. Um, I don't get paid for this. I should, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, they make awesome shoes, and uh, they make them in relatively limited quantities, uh, so the, you, the chance that you'll be able to... We get that one is relatively small, but they come out with new ones all the time. And um, yeah, 
it's it's amazing. I like good shoes. That's uh, I think the last time we talked, you were in Vegas, and that's the one of the first things that I was like, "Damn, check out those shoes!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got some really really crazy shoes. So yeah, very cool. It, uh, it, I I felt for a long time that it's unfair that the women get to have all the fun with shoes. So uh... bringing it back to the men's side. <laughs> yeah, nice. Uh, well, should we get into some SEO? Yeah, let's let's get into it. Um, Yoast, where would you like to start? Wherever you want, guys. I'm, Let, let's, I'm... let's go from uh, let's let's go to basics. So, like, when we, you have an, a WordPress instance, you've you've uh, designed your website, you've laid it all out. Where do we go from there? Um. Well, I'm going to assume that you've not yet installed an SEO plugin, but by that time you probably should. Um, Do you have one you recommend? Um, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure. There, there's like one good one. No. <laughs> uh, in all honesty, any SEO plugin is only as good as the content that you produce, end up producing on your site. So, uh, yes, of course, I would re recommend our own. And we I do think we do a lot of things under the hood that will help you. Um, but most of what we do technically is taking away barriers to getting your content indexed. Um, after that, it's up to you to have a well-structured site, to have good content, and well, more that's becoming more and more important as well. Everybody is getting better at doing all these things. Yeah. Uh, over time, and I can tell you, I mean, 14 years ago, the SEO industry was the wild west, but right now it's pretty much like follow best practices and keep on doing that, and then just get better and better at. at writing good content and um, and structuring your site well and, and combining all these things. And, it, <clears throat> and that, that really has come a long way. I mean, uh, you know, it, it used to be, you know, just like you said, wild, wild west. I mean, it's just uh, – it's... Yeah, it was weird, man. I mean, I, 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 I've been there from the very beginning when when we could still create PR9 domains in the Netherlands without too much work. Mm -hmm. um, and and of course that was all through legitimately acquired links and everything <clears throat> um, but yeah now that's changed and honestly probably for the better because the search results sh do reflect a lot more of what should be popular right now than they did like 10 years ago yeah I think you recently undertook a massive scientific approach to the checks and the plugins, and it was kind of a, yeah. a new philosophy for you. What was behind all of that, and what was the outcome of that kind of change in how you looked at your checks? Um, well, it, the funny thing is that we, we've always been very research-driven at Yoast. It's just that we've always fought it too hard to, to really come up with good to, – to really – show that one specific thing actually helps you rank. Um, and I still think that's pretty much impossible. Um, so it, it had always been based on stuff like uh, uh, what I knew had worked for me in the past, what others had been telling me that had worked for them in the past, what I'd seen work on other sites. So you did research, but it's not like real research because – None of that is like really scientifically validated. So we tried to do that a bit more recently. And I think actually that, uh, what that showed is that some of the things that we were doing were complete bullshit. Um, but luckily, there was only relatively few of them. Um, and some of the things that the SEO industry really doesn't want to talk about anymore uh, actually turned out to be pretty good indicators. So things like keyword density, which is a lame term for you know, for lots of reasons, but it turns out to be a really good, simple indicator of did you mention the word that you want to rank for enough? And of course, that doesn't mean that you can say it in a, in a true percentage that it, and that that percentage should be 0.1 or 0.2 higher or lower, and that and all of that is never going to really help. But if you want to rank for something, you really have to use the word. Um, and so it, it also brought me back to basics a bit on like, okay, so what's really important? What's really helping things to rank? Um, 
And we're doing more research like that now. We've, we've, uh, we're in the lucky position that we have a very large team that can do all these things. And a lot of very intelligent people that um, like doing research and that come up with you know, with better ideas all the time to research these things. So it's, we're doing we're doing stuff around uh, our internal linking right now, and like it's seeing how we can improve that. And just seeing the internal research where I'm in meetings with people and I'm Googling what they're saying as they're saying it because I don't understand what they're saying anymore. <laughs> uh, and, and you go like, oh yeah, damn, that's a good idea. And yeah, it's, it's really inspiring. What signal do you think is relied on too heavily by users, when you look at the literature that's out there, what's being oversimplified when it comes to SEO? What, what are people leaning on too much? Well, the, the, the funny thing is, is I think everyone is looking for ranking factors all the time, and I don't really believe in them. Um, and they forget to do proper keyword research. So maybe uh, they put so the cart before the horse a little bit? They... They worry about the yeah, ranking. it's it's a lot like yeah. I I need to do this trick and this trick, and it, they still think in tricks too much, and not enough in how do people actually search for me, and if they reach my site, how will they actually find the content that they need? Um, because that is one of the, the hardest things that I've always found, especially in optimizing WordPress sites, uh, and mostly when they're blogged, um, is that their bounce rate is ridiculously high very often. So you need to figure out a way to get people on your site and then keep them there um, and, and point them to the content that they were really needing, which is a matter of internal linking a lot. So I think one of the most under uh, uh, undervalued things that we have in the SEO industry is still internal linking. It's one of the first things we did 10 years ago, and it's still today. It's like, how do you build that site structure in such a way that you push the right pages up? Um, it's still a, a, an art form that's not appreciated enough. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. I mean, a good example of, you know, you need links that back up the pages that you're linking from. You know, for example, like if you're let's let's take a law firm, you're talking about personal injury stuff and then you you have blog posts relating to that same thing. I think that is a great way to kind of give those signals of as to what they're talking about, you know. Yeah, and also to, to every once in a while go back and reevaluate, like, hey, I'm, I want to rank for this keyword, and now I have six different pages on my site that try to rank for that thing. Maybe I should just go in and combine some of these into something better. Yeah, and, that gets lost a lot. It's that it's no longer about ranking websites. It's really about ranking pages, and you got to go into it with that mindset. Yeah, you have to. Google doesn't rank websites. They rank pages. <laughs> no, yeah, they yeah. They rank URLs, and 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 some some sites are strong enough to rank with one or with more than one URL for specific terms, and then you can play with that. Yeah. But most of the people that we talk to are definitely don't have that strength. Yeah, definitely. You know, I I I, I need to I need to say something I forgot to say in the beginning of the episode. Today is my son's birthday, and I do want to wish him Gracious. a very happy birthday. <laughs> Uh, I meant to say that in the beginning, but we had a lot going on and uh, forgot to mention it. But happy birthday, son. I, I think he's listening. Well, happy birthday. We have to rank highly for that term on this podcast. <laughs> happy birthday for his name. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to cut that off there. Let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, keyword distribution because one of the signals in Yoast is uh, keyword distribution, and a lot of people yeah. aren't really sensitive to that. We've talked about keyword density for years. Tell us about keyword distribution and what does that mean to the plugin and what is it checking for? Well, so if if you write about a certain topic and you check and you just check keyword density or whatever is your method to check whether you've written enough about that topic, um, then you could have like if you have a thousand word article, you can mention your your specific keyword that you want to rank for um, seven times in the lower two paragraphs of your article, and your keyword density could still be okay. But your keyword, your keyword distribution would be way off because your article is actually about something else. You're just tagging on that keyword on the last bits of your paragraph. And what we're seeing more and more is that uh, search engines are getting better at actually 
understanding the the topic of your text and for them to understand that the topic of your text is the thing that you want to rank for you need to uh, uh, use that keyword more throughout your text and do and really make it the be the well the true topic of your entire text so we check for keyword distribution and see whether you're actually using that keyword enough throughout your and the, the length of your text and if you do that right then keyword density suddenly be, no longer is an issue so it's uh it's relatively new it's it's actually one of the things that came out of our team of linguists that we have that was looking at okay so how can we define the topic of this page um, we do a lot of these analyses, and, and well, keyword distribution turned out to be a very good measure for that. So tell us about that versus the theorists who say the keyword has to be in the first 60 words, and it's got to be in the H1, and if you get the appropriate density in the first 60 words, <coughs> what's below that is less of a signal. How do you balance those two contrasting theories? Well, it's, I actually think that these things serve different purposes. So if you... If someone searched for a keyword and came to your page um, and, and is expecting a topic about that key, a, a post or a page about that keyword, it's very good to have that keyword in the first paragraph to reinforce that they are on the right page and to not make them bounce. So even from a user perspective, it's important to, to make sure that they realize that they're on the right page. And then... As they go through, uh, they need to to they need to be uh, to be reinforced the whole time that they're still reading about that topic. And if you you're going to switch to a different topic halfway for your post, then it's no longer interesting to them. And I think that is enough reason to do it. And of course, search engines are smart enough to see that if there's like a lot of different things in a post, that a bit of that post could be interesting, but not all of it. So that, yeah. So I, I think they're both important. I, I think that they can be true at the same time. Um, I don't really think that the, having the, uh, the keyword in that H1 is all that important all the time. I do think that having it in the page title is important, but that's something else. Now, uh, you know, typically you see with, with the blogs, at least, you do see a higher bounce rate than usual. You know, than you would see on a like an e-commerce site or something like that. The yeah, uh, I, I I would I'd like to add that you know the structure of your website and the the way you've got it laid out goes a long way when it comes to those kind of you know just a blog um, because you have to try and get them, you know, tease them on to another article or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and that's actually hard because at that point you have to. Um, you have to have related content that actually works and you have to tease them there in a proper way. Um, it's why we have our internal linking tools in USCO and why we're working on improving them because I actually think that uh, that having those, uh, well, suggesting good internal links is a good thing. Yeah. Doing it through a related post widget that's, some, that's hidden somewhere below your post is often not the best way. Yeah. Because people have already left at that point. Yep. So the taxonomy, how the website is built, is as much as the pre-planning process as the keyword research. Do you agree? Absolutely. Um, I I think that if you have the luxury of, of planning out a website entirely for, uh, from the beginning, then then you do the keyword research first, and then you go to your site structure, uh, and and then you go to actually writing that thing. Um, now. I do realize that most people don't have that luxury because they already have a website and they have some stuff, but not all of it. But it still makes sense to look at what you have and, and come up with like, okay, so what would a good structure for this be? And then slowly start filling in those gaps that you have within your site. You know, I always remind people, at least here in the States, remember back in elementary school when they taught you outlining? Remember that back in fifth or sixth grade, you know, Roman number one was the main topic and then it went to A. If you can yeah. flash back to that concept of outlining then you can kind of get a sense of what a website structure should be yeah it, it's funny there's a lot of stuff that we do in our plugin and also in uh, in our courses uh, is really like pretty basic writing like uh, how do you use transition words the funny thing is that our kids can remind us of that most adults seem to have forgotten 
<clears throat> so it's like yeah, all, all that stuff makes makes stuff more readable, and all, and and all those lessons also really help in building a, a good website. Definitely. I mean, <clears throat> now I know you're diving deep into this right now with a lot of schema. Um, I have, yeah. I recently have done some quite a bit of schema work for some clients and have seen dramatic changes in in the, in rankings. And I know it's not probably not direct, but it has increased click through rate and all that other stuff. So obviously, that's improving those rankings because you're getting a higher click-through rate uh, as well yeah i've been working with john o. i don't know if you know john o. elderson um yeah. he, he uh, started working for us i think about a year and a half ago now um and um john i've been working on a document to like how do we tie all these schema blocks on a page together and and we've been playing with that a bit and i think we now have um, what I can call the most ultimate schema solution of tying everything on a page to everything. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes one big graph. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really awesome. It, uh, it, it's, it also induces headaches because it's very hard to keep on doing right. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, yeah, it's, it's really, really powerful. And, um, we're going to release that literally a week from now. Um, we're in the in the final testing phases, and I'm writing documentation as a madman at the moment. Um, and a lot of other people in the team are are testing and writing documentation so that and, and so that we have all the APIs and everything that everybody wants to tap into. How it's going to be really cool. How in depth is it? Um, you know, <clears throat> having. Things like geo um, uh, yeah, so relationships have, and all that stuff is does it go that deep or? Yeah, yeah. So we have we have a couple of plugins, right? So we have the basic Geos SEO, um, and then we have add-ons uh, to that. Basic Geos SEO will do stuff like organization, person, website, uh, web page, breadcrumbs, um, and some some smaller add-ons to that. And then, for instance, our local SEO plugin will add all the local business market. Um, and geo stuff and address and uh, a lot of other things. We have a WooCommerce SEO plugin that ties it entirely to WooCommerce and, and combines WooCommerce schema output with ours in such a way that it all works fantastically well. Um, and we have a news SEO plugin that really tie, goes into doing all the news, art, news article stuff and all the other stuff that you need to uh, have for news carousels now and all, the, all those other things. So yeah, I'm... Um, it's really it's it's been a tremendous amount of work to get this all right, but I think that uh, well once you once you see it you'll you'll go like oh yeah that's really a big step ahead for everybody because I we've also written like full out documentation of everything that we've built so that others nice. can um you can like see what schema we're outputting and how we're combining things and how that works together so I hope that that will uh, uh, really put the industry a step ahead uh, again in how we do all this. It's really the value of the plugin is not only does it do all those things, but it elegantly does it simply. Yeah. So that it's so much more understandable than a lot of other tools on the market. Yeah, because I mean, if yeah. you you're a coder, but you know, writing JSON LD uh, schema markup is not easy. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let me tell you. No, no. no. Getting uh, getting it to to getting the structured data tester, uh, Google structured data tester to to actually understand it and understand the relationships between these things is, is quite hard. Yeah. We've actually been working with Google on the, on a couple of these things because in a couple of uh, 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 instances, we found bugs in, in how they parse these things. So we were literally like trying to, to get that to work better. Um, so yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot of cool stuff happening there. And Google has been pushing some new schema over the last few months as well. There's, so there's a lot of uh, stuff happening there. I'm yeah I'm I'm really really excited about where it's, this is going. I was it, yeah I was, sorry. I was just gonna say it, it's a literal rabbit hole. Go, how in depth it goes and how much time it takes to just all the detail and information. But I'm, yeah, but that's also why we wanted to do it because in a way I think it's it's nonsense that every SEO in the world should be able to should do that. Uh, we should take yeah. care of most 
most of those details for you. The problem is that the plugins that were out there and the way we were looking at it for a long time, we needed to add all these input fields everywhere to get all that data. And uh, even though we already had that data in other places, what's your, really didn't like, what's your relationship with Google? How are they providing data that improves your product? Uh, we talk to them, well, I, I'd say almost weekly. Um, and the same goes for Bing and a couple of other platforms. Um, we're, we have a good working relationship. I mean, we've reached a size where if we change things, they'll notice. Um, but it's also, um, we, we're optimizing for what they want to optimize for, which is like that, that end goal of having better websites. So we're optimizing for more than just Google. I, I really think that if, if people follow our advice, we'll have a better website that'll do every, do better everywhere not just in Google or just in Bing, but everywhere, just because that's the end goal that the, all those search engines optimize for. Yeah. It, it, it's also and, real. Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean to cut you off. No, no, they, 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 I think they realize that that is what we optimize for and, and they, they see that vision and believe in it and believe in it in the same way. So that's why we can work together really well. Yeah. I, I think an important takeaway for listeners when it comes to schema, it's not just about getting the stars on your, uh, on your, your snippet in the res- no, in the no. SERPs. Yeah. It's, it's more than that. It's getting Google and any search engine to understand the relationship between where you're located, what you offer. It does amazing things. Yeah. It's basically helping the search engines understand what the site's about in order to return it adequately to people who are looking for that type of content. Right. Yeah. It's funny because earlier on you mentioned like Google ranks pages, not websites. And that's true. But at the same time, using, um, uh, good schema you can really tie your the, your website together as a more cohesive web you can yeah. really show them that it's one big thing that that has relationships to each other yeah that's that's definitely true you know I always talk when i'm uh, speaking that our relationship with google is very very tenuous it doesn't feel that way all the time but if you and i went to google three times in a row and got back absolutely nothing related to what we want what would we do We'd bail, right? Yeah. We'd try something else. It wouldn't take a lot of irrelevant returns in order for us to leave. And so when you think behind the scenes about what Google's objective is, you just kind of simplify and focus on that is they have to get to you and I as users exactly what we're looking for because it seems like it's a habit, but it's a very tenuous relationship that we have with it. Yeah, hey, absolutely, yeah. So when it, not to go back to plugins too much, but – when it comes to plugins, I think it's very important to stress that the less the plugins, the mo, the 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 better. Um, obviously, because of page speed, load time, and all that, you know that stuff. But it really depends on the quality of the plugins, though. Um, I, you can have like fifty small plugins, and there would be no problem whatsoever. Um, you can if you have fifty plugins that are all huge and all do a lot of different things at the same time, then yeah, it'll slow down your site. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean so you, have, right. you have people that use plugins for everything, for plug-in YouTube, plug-in. for <laughs> you name it. Yeah. It. Well, isn't there a plugin to help you decide what plugins you're not using? Yeah. Right. <laughs> nah, that's sad, but... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do realize that I, I see a lot of uh, people really use a lot of plugins and you go like, why, you, why do you need this? What we, uh, what we often see is that when people have a security plugin, they, they usually don't have one, but they have like four or five. <laughs> um, if they have an SEO plugin, they'll very often have more than one. Yeah, on the agency that, side, we see that because, you know, a client's been with agency A, and agency A favors plugins one, two, and three, and then they move to agency B, and agency B favors yeah. pl- plugins four, five, and six, but nobody ever goes in there and cleans them out. And the next thing you know, you got this giant attic worth of plugins in a site because one's favored by one agency and not the other. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It, I, there's, there's, and, and cleaning that up can be really painful. Um, uh, there's not always enough inter you know, like they don't always work together very well 
Uh, actually, in the SEO plugin space, we've been relatively good about that. I think most uh, most of those uh, plugins are you can export and import data from, mm -hmm. or there is at least a plugin that can really easily can, uh, take your uh, data from A to B. Um, it's about choice, and if people want something else, well, then they should be able to have that. There, I mean, there really should be. Uh, oh yeah, it's time for a break. We'll be right back with Yost Devolk, and we're going to do uh, who influences the influencer. Uh, we're going to see who Yost follows to get his insider information. That's going to be great. Yes, we'll Today's be right back. This episode of Search Talk Live is sponsored by Directed is an industry leading search marketing agency fully focused on helping B2B marketing teams increase their results. If you're looking to increase your marketing qualified leads and decrease your cost per acquisition for search engines, I'd highly recommend you take a look at their site. We actually had their CEO, Garrett Marguth, on the show, and I can honestly say these guys are doing some great stuff. I hear that they even have their own analytics system that lets you correlate your SEO, PPC, or content efforts directly to revenue. If you're a B2B company and thinking about switching agencies or if you're in-house and need help, I'd give Directive a look. Visit directiveconsulting.com or call 949-214-4024. Again, that's 949-214-4024. Again, that's directive at directiveconsulting.com. One of the major factors in ranking a website is quality backlinks to your site. There is much debate on what is the proper way to build links. Do it the wrong way and you could find yourself in a penalty. Follow best practices and your site could be rewarded by ranking higher in the search engines. As an SEO, it's very time consuming, along with the many other ranking factors you have to address on a website. You could spend days and months trying to get one quality backlink to your site. That is why I want to tell you about the No BS Marketplace. At NoBS, you can connect with over 10,000 digital publishers. By following link building best practices, you can take full control of your link building campaigns and make it more cost effective for your clients. At NoBS, they allow you to review publishers, approve content, and customize it to a whole new level, giving you the quality content that is so important. With pricing starting at just $100 per link, why not try a different way to build links? As a Search Talk Live listener, NoBS is offering you 20% off your first order. Just use promo code Search Talk Live to get started today. Go to nobs.link. That is n o b s dot l i n k. Get your questions in on Twitter. Type hashtag Search Talk Live and your question. Now back to the show. All right, we're back. Can Yoast? So tell us, who influences you? Who, where do you get your uh, information in the industry? Who do you follow? That type of thing. Um, so there's a couple of different things. Um, of course, I'm basically in two industries, so I need to follow up with both the WordPress industry and the SEO industry. Um, for the SEO industry, I mostly do that through Twitter and Facebook. Um and uh, then there's a couple of groups on Facebook where I get uh, good advice. Um, oh, most of those are closed, though, unfortunately. Um, and there's a, a, a group of people I follow on Twitter. Um, mostly a lot of the uh, the old-time SEOs that I've known for a long time and, uh, and a couple of uh, relative newcomers. <coughs> so give us an example of some of the, of the older SEO folks that you have followed for some time. Uh, so that would be people like Dave Naylor, Greg Bozer, uh, um, really friends from uh, from times long gone, I have to say. Um, but it's also uh, Bill Slosky. Um, Good one. Is it, um, who else? Let me let me go through my list and see who I uh, interact with a lot uh, or, or check out a lot. I think it's really a lot of people like that, and they just, and I just see what they retweet. It's not even that much SEOs in whom I follow anymore because I honestly there's not always that much new stuff happening. Then of course there's like the guys from from the standards team. So there's Dan Brickley who does like all the schema.org work at Google. 
um, uh, uh, a lot of Googlers, really, because uh, in all different areas of, of Google, um, people on the Chrome team, because you often see them tweet cool new stuff that then later on uh, goes into the uh, um, into the SEO industry. Um, a lot of people on the Safari team. I, I started my open source career as a um, contributor to WebKit, which is which was the core of Safari and Chrome back then. Um, so I still follow a lot of people from them back then, but they, they also still provide a lot of fun insights. So when they do stuff around privacy and change how cookies work, stuff like that, I really like to follow that. Um, and then there's a lot of developers that I follow um, from all over. Um, and then just try to see like, okay, there are all, all those developers that are on the, um, and that are doing the cool new stuff. How can I, um, how can you use that for SEO? How could that be problematic for SEO? So I try to apply stuff from outside of the SEO industry into the stuff inside the SEO industry. Okay. That's quite a list. And I think we should point out that a lot of people follow you. <laughs> well, me uh, as an at Jada Falk, I'm not really happy with my follower account yet. I mean, I used to be at Yoast, and that is like a, a slightly bigger account than at Jada Falk is. Just so. <laughs> Just something like 10 times. So, yeah. <laughs> we'll see if we can ramp that up for you as a result of being on the show. I want to come back a little bit to this concept of uh, keyword density. I know a lot of people struggle with this because they they really struggle with the idea of writing something with the appropriate frequency that doesn't sound like it's been written with the appropriate frequency, if you know that what I is, mean. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And if if that if your text is right and that – and that bullet in your SEO is off, then, then keep it like that. I mean, it's not, I'm never going to say, we're, we're not going to tell people to always chase every green bullet and, and always do exactly what we say in our analysis. It, it can be hard, and especially if you're writing shorter texts, it, it looks really weird. So, so how, how can listeners figure out if Google has semantically connected terms, like auto and car or hairdresser and hairstylist so that the writing is less mundanely repetitive Correct. and more kind of latent semantic indexing is, is put in. How can they figure out if Google has finally associated this keyword phrase with that keyword phrase? Well, in the, in the examples you, you, you gave, like auto and car, it's really simple. If you search for auto in the search results and you combine it with some other keywords, you'll, you'll see that Google also highlights car for you. Um, so even right there in the search results, you'll see that it thinks it's a synonym, um, but that's not always the case. I, in a way, if you think it's a synonym, then use it like that. If if you think it's related to it, then use it like that. I mean, it's really not the, the overcomplicating it with things like LSI or TDF or TFIDF or um, or all these methods of calculating that, I think takes the humanity out of it. And I think that the humanity is exactly the thing that, that makes you, makes it possible for you to rank. Um, so you really should be focusing on writing a good piece of copy that, that really does what it needs to do, whether that is informing people or persuading people or whatever. Um, but it, it won't hurt to then, after you've written it, look back and, and see like, okay, so I wanted to rank for this term. If I look at this page, do I think that this is a good result for that term? And even without looking at things like keyword density, that question, like, are you really a good result for that term? Do you deserve to rank if you look at it honestly? Um, I think most people will... And we'll go back and go like, okay, so what's the other, what are the, the pages in the top 10 for that term? If you look at those pages and your own, what are you doing that makes you better than any of those? And why should you be there? What about for businesses that have to compete with directories? And directories often rank higher because they have a certain breadth or girth of <coughs> relevant content. But individual business A may have a more valuable page with more valuable content to the individual searcher, but that directory is tough to hop over because of the girth of relevant content. Yeah. 
Um, it really depends where you are, but um, in most of those cases, then you'll probably be able to win it locally, but maybe not nationally. Uh, so it, it depends a bit on what type of website it is. If you're a local business, you might you might be able to to rank for the terms that are important to you in your local area. I know a, a good example of this is my mom. She's a relational therapist. And she ranks locally. She ranks very well for the keywords that she needs to rank for. If you go nationally, even on the Dutch level, which is not a large country. I mean, the, the, the state of New York has more people than the entire country of the Netherlands. Um, but um, if you go nationally, she, she doesn't rank everywhere, but she doesn't need to because she doesn't need to have 400 new clients every month because she can never take those. Yeah. So it really is like, where do you need to rank and what is important to you? So how are your signals in the plugin adapting with the more personalized search results that Google is serving up? How do you have to change to keep abreast of that? Well, first of all, I think personalization in search results is hugely overestimated. Mm. I think a lot of it is way more localization, so local to position, than truly personalization. Mm. Um, at the same time, if people have clicked on your site more, then, they, then of course the, your site will probably show up higher for them. There's nothing you need to do for that other than have a good site. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the personalization factors that I truly see that work, I mean, for me, I, I read The Guardian a lot. Uh, I used to work with them. I really like it. So when I search for news in English, I get The Guardian a lot because Google knows I'm likely to click on that. Um, but they don't need to do anything for that other than just keep on being a good site. Yeah. You know, in, I've kind of taken a different approach with content. Um I've done, you know, I've used for my for my clients, I use content writers, but I don't use if they tell me they're an SEO writer and I've used them a million times and, and done really well. But more recently, I've gone probably in the last two years, I've gone to just regular writers, people that are really, you know, like quality. Yeah, they're just good writers. Type. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Give them a topic. Yeah. And give some, <coughs> some some examples of writing styles, and let them run with it because nine times yeah. out of ten, because it's really good written content, it ranks. I I agree, and it, and you'll see that um, one of the bits of research that we uh, we're looking at how we can do that even better. It's like how important is the text is actually readable. It's why we in, in, why we added the readability checks to Yoast SEO. Yeah. Because I think that that's probably more important than a lot of our SEO checks. If your text is not readable, then you can rank. But if people click and they can't understand what you're saying, then you've basically done all that work for naught. So um, readability of text and, and having good, nice-to-read copy is so important. Yeah, I mean, I've seen so many times where an SEO writer, you, you give them the keyword phrase you're, you're looking for, and then the, the content comes out just doesn't make any sense mechanical you know? yeah it's exactly. very yeah mechanical. yeah and, and that's where uh, seo writing and seo copywriting as as an industry for a long time is as focused on the wrong things yeah and um I, well we want to be part of doing that better uh, and i think we are um but that means that that we have to focus on on things like readability and on how are you really covering your topic more than are you using this keyword everywhere the whole time? Do you see a check in the plugin in the future that measures the potential effectiveness as a voice search result? Well, in a way, we already do that by by forcing you into the smaller sentence, uh, shorter sentences. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things that people really get annoyed with because um, they say, like, "Yeah, but but I have this." I have to. I want to write these these long texts because that's what I'm good at. And I'm like, yeah, but then try and read that out loud and still make understand what it says. 
um, web text has had these, these rules of not having too long sentences and too long paragraphs for a long time. Um, and, that, and for voice search, that's even more important. And funnily enough, when you look at it and when you start making text more readable, you also see that it becomes more readable for an algorithm. So an algorithm can more easily determine the topic when a text is, be is better readable. What's your sense of whether or not that content has to follow a question answer format in order to be viable for a voice search ranking? The cases where that, that is the case now, it's a matter of time. I think schema has a lot of help. Yeah, I, I think so too. I There's a lot of work being done there. I, I do think that when you do voice search, um, you are often doing that as you're doing something else. And at, at those points in time, you're more likely to answer to ask questions that can be answered like that. So that's why you see the question answer thing really work for voice search now, because it's a particular type of query. Um, as we use voice search more in other scenarios, I think that will change. Um, and and that tendency will will change with it. I don't think that the only thing we need to be writing in the next couple of decades is FAQs. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, but you know those work good too if you mark them up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, it's it's really valuable content. Don't get me wrong, and I think it's important that if you have a lot of content on your site and you have a product and etc. and then at some point making an FAQ for a product is probably a good idea. And yes, that will probably do well in this particular types of queries on voice search, especially. Um, but do I think that that is the be all end all of it? No, absolutely not. We're definitely headed for some interesting times regarding this. If somebody, oh, absolutely. Somebody yeah, put out a yeah. great blog post, uh, I forget who wrote it, but they associated voice search responses with organic ranking and there was like a 80 percent correlation between being a voice search source and ranking number one or number two organically so it's kind of a chicken egg thing you're not going to get the voice search answer opportunity unless you're already ranking organically so you have to do those basic building blocks of ranking organically anyway to even be in the voice search answer marketplace yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see how uh, new schemas like Speakable tie into that. Yes. Yeah. That's uh, exciting. We could do so a whole show I, on that. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're, we're playing with it. I'm, I'm trying to see whether we can we can work it in in a, in a nice way into, into the plugin. Um, the hardest things with all of these things is like, what's the interface for this? And how do I explain this to a normal user? Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> that, that, that's the challenge right there, and I think you've done it marvelously, by the way, is you've got to add features and functionality to keep pace, but at the same time, you have to keep it a DIY tool, and it's sometimes there's an intersection, right? I mean, the more yeah. features you add, the more complex it gets, the harder yeah, it is to maintain Yeah, so we try to, to not do these. And so with, we, we're doing this huge schema change next week, and we're literally only changing one option in the settings. And everything else is automatic. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's... Uh, because I don't think that anyone is capable of making these choices. When I travel, people often ask me, what's the difference between Wix and WordPress? And I often say that Wix is kind of at that same intersection right now. They either have to decide to be more robust in their functionality and get more complex, or they've got to stay a very simple DIY tool, but it's really hard to be both. It is incredibly hard to be both, and we, we've, um, as Yoast, we've had, we've had this this history of being used first by all the SEOs, and being promoted by the SEO industry itself. Because I, well, that was basically what was happening. A lot of SEOs were promoting our tools to other people, um, and SEOs want granular control over a lot of things, and then you slowly get a, a, a different. A user uh, group that doesn't necessarily need all that control and is confused by it. So it's really hard to walk that line of giving enough control so that everybody's happy and at the same time not having uh, a setting for every bloody thing in your plugin.
Yeah, and you really have to be careful too because if you, if schema is not written correctly, Google will let you know, okay. and they'll sometimes de-index a page. Yeah, you give people too much power to do schema, they do it wrong, and then they end up getting penalized for it. Yeah, yeah. So you kind of yeah, have to limit yeah. what they can do. Yeah, well, I, we we're not limiting them per se, but we're not opening up like interfaces for it. I'm not going to allow people to say to say that every page has a five star uh, rating. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, I think that's the, the problem with schema. You, you can do that, and you can do it for two weeks, and then and then you'll never have rich snippets in, uh, ever again. And um, so, so that's why the, those things don't need an interface. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's time for leave it or leave it. All right, you know, it's one of the most popular features on Search Talk Live, believe it or leave it. And we're going to surprise you with three statements we found on the Internet, blog posts, etc. People believe these. We're going to see if you do. So your goal is to tell our audience whether they should believe it or whether they should leave it. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, the first one. The increase in voice searches will render content length less meaningful as a ranking signal. Believe it. Or leave it. Leave it. Just, really? So yeah. no impact on content length. If I think they're different things. Yeah. It's your uh, so content length is the, the the thing is voice searches are not replacing desktop searches. Only in very very few instances are they doing that. They're they're an add on. They're different types of results that you have to do different things for. Way to look at it. Yeah. All right, number two. Using statistics such as bounce rate and time on page are not a ranking signal. I, whatever. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I don't care. They're very good signals to see whether your site is doing what it should be doing, and and they're very good KPIs to see like are you improving your site or not. You know, and that's what? why you should. Go ahead, sorry. That's what you should look at. I really don't care about whether you Google uses it for them for ranking or not. You know, you ne we never could get a clear answer from Google. No, I love asking this, believe it or leave it, with different guests because yeah. it's such a polarizing topic. I mean, it there is. are people that swear on it because they say it's the absolute <laughs> indicator of customer satisfaction. And then we've had other guests that say they're not even in the equation. Yeah. But the thing is that for – I don't care. So I don't care to think about ranking signals anymore, which might sound really problematic, but it's like, I just want to build better sites. And if I do that, and if I make them technically and content wise better all the time, then they'll do better. Yeah. And I said this on our last episode, but you know, you're not trying to rank number one anymore. It's number three or, you know, it's number four or five because the local was uh, three pack and all that stuff. Right. Where the number one ranking is on the page anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sometimes below the fold. Yeah. Right. All right. Believe it or leave it. Number three, Yoast. A page must be updated at least twice a year to be considered fresh content. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> uh, I don't care. Um, our WordPress SEO article has just had a, a major update, but it's it's ranked number one for WordPress SEO for well over a decade now. Um, with ha while only having been updated ever so often, sometimes three, four years, we didn't touch it. Yeah, and I do remember the article that this one came from. It was a, a blogger who was talking about the the importance of fresh content, which I think we'd all agree has some some value. But he was very prescriptive in his uh, almost like having a to do list for content, and one of it was you know have a specific interval that you go back and you update your content that either is already ranking well or has the potential to rank well. And so for him, it was kind of like your, your house cleaning chores, you know, every two weeks. Yeah, so this and every three uh, so weeks I agree that. that that is important. And for, and I want, I think it's, but that's not because of your ranking, but because if, if stuff that's in your posts that you're giving to people reading your site isn't true anymore, then you should fix that. Yeah. Uh, but it's not because of, because of your ranking. Which is it's really query-specific, right? 
I mean, yeah. so if you're going to write an article on, uh, you know, the best recipe for a pina colada, that really doesn't have to be updated all that often. It's not going to change. No. But if you're going to write an article on the best Bluetooth wireless headsets. Yeah. <laughs> you'd, you'd, ha- you'd better damn well change that every three months. Yeah. Yeah. And then every six months is not good enough either because then you're going to be lagging behind. Right. Right. All right. So I think it's time for the Search Talk Live Tattoo. tattoo. And this has been a great show, Yost. Lots of good nuggets. And uh, it's been a great show because I know so many of our listeners use the plug-in and and are big fans of yours as well. So let's wrap up the show with your most succinct advice that you could give for WordPress SEO. And it's got to be very short because this is a tattoo that Robert gets, and he's got limited body parts available. So what would you (laughs) say is your best Search Talk Live tattoo to close the show? Um, Install Yoast SEO. (laughs) I knew that was it. (laughs) A little bit of the selfish side, but... Uh, Yoast, you get a lot of PR on 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 um, on the Yoast plugin, but what other plugins do you have? Um, we actually have relatively little now. We have a few outside of uh, so we have around Yoast SEO. We have things like local SEO, news SEO, video SEO. They're all related to um, well to 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 Yoast SEO and to optimizing your site. Um, we have a a small group of, of other plugins that we put out. Um, one that I work on myself um, relatively often still is called Comment Hex. Um, it's what we use to keep comments maintainable in Yoast.com. Oh. Uh, so it's all sort of different hacks to um, allow um, redirecting first time commenters to clean up uh, comment notification emails. Uh, so it, it does a lot of, of small stuff like that that I really uh, I think is important when you when you really value comments on your blog. Yeah. Well, Yost, I want to thank you for being on the show. It has been awesome. I know it's late where you're at right now. Um, uh, it is. It's time to get to bed. I need to get up in like seven hours. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, I really appreciate your time, and uh, I'll probably see you at one of the events sometime. Thanks for staying up with us. Uh, my pleasure, guys. Yep. Have a great day. Thank you. you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening to the show. Uh, we'll be back next week. We are. T- oh, no, you could, you could have kept it going. Just <laughs> we'll be back next week. Thanks a lot. We'll see you later. Talk Live is sponsored by the Robert Palmer family of companies. If you have questions for Search Talk Live or you're interested in being a guest or a sponsor of the show, email Robert at searchtalklive.com. That's searchtalklive.com.